and Andrew is continuing his lecture on massive gravity. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so yes, so I'm just going to uh, continue uh, with the discussion of uh, uh, our uh, various modified theories of gravity and what form they take. Uh, and just, uh, just to remind you what we were talking about before, uh, maybe give a bit of context uh, in, in case there was any confusion. Effectively, what I was doing was calculating the analog of the generating functional in quantum field theory. Uh, so if you had a scalar field, then the formal definition for the generating functional in quantum field theory would look like this. In other words, it's the expectation value of If I compute that, for example, for a uh, free quantum field, so I can write just a free, uh, free scalar field like that, plus ij phi, and I perform the path integral. And for a free field, this is easy to do, and it basically just means I solve the classical equations of motion, which are equal to, which are given by this. And the formal solution of those, technically it's with a Green's function, but I'll just write it as 1 over box plus i epsilon uh, times j. And the i epsilon is the fact that in a path integral, we should be using the Feynman propagator if we're doing a time-ordered path integral. And if we substitute that in, uh, in this action, then the, the solution for the, the generating functional will look like J of x one in the box plus i epsilon uh, j of x. Uh, and so, in other words, the generating functional itself, just w j, is minus a half integral four x j of x one in the box plus i epsilon j of x. So that's the standard scalar field theory result. And what effectively I was deriving, or uh, giving you yesterday is if we now do the analog, if we have a theory of gravity <coughs> uh, described by some uh, metric perturbation, uh, well, so described by a, a metric you knew, and well, I'll write it in terms of the metric perturbation, which is coupled in general to t mu, then the analog of the generating function I, will, I would think about is e to the i w function of t mu, which formally is the expectation value of the time order product, uh, other than d dimensions, h mu nu of x, t mu nu of x. Uh, that's effectively what I was calculating. And then the statement is that if you, if you utilize the uh, and Lehman representation, uh, for spin two. So this is a standard quantum field theory result that I'm bother borrowing to give you the answer. Then the statement is that for any unitary local quantum field theory, then the form uh, that W takes to second order in T, and this is not just a T-level <coughs> classical statement, it's a fully quantum statement, the generic form it takes is of the following form, so it's a superposition So in the case when you have a stress energy is the tensor structure is non-trivial. So this is a contribution from a massless graviton, which would look like this. Uh, 
Uh, so that's the generating function of the quadratic order from a massless graviton contribution. And then on top of that, there can in general be some mass, uh, some spin zero contribution, which couples to the trace of the stress energy. And there'll be a spectral sum of that. And then on top of that, there'll be a contribution from any massive gravitons inside the system, which generically we have, as we saw last time in these various extra dimensional models, BGP and Randall Sundrum and so on, you in general have a tower of massive graviton contributions, uh, and they also come with a spectral sum contribution. Uh, I call this D before, actually. D. So zero is for spin zero, two is for spin two. Uh, D D X D D X prime D mu nu X one over box minus M squared plus I epsilon D mu nu X prime minus one over D minus one. <coughs> x, 1 over box, minus m squared plus i to 1, g, x prime. And then unitarity is encoded in the statement that uh, z here, which is, the way, that, which is the wave function renormalization, is positive. The spectral uh, density for spin 0 is positive, and the spectral density for the spin 2 part as well. This is the most general answer you can have to quadratic in order in T mu nu, T mu nu for a conserved source. There's nothing, nothing else you can do in a theory that's unitary log upon a field theory and it's also Lorentz invariant. So the fact that that's the most general thing you can do is, is this consequence of the Chalon Lehman vector representation, you can derive that uh, essentially from further principles. Are there any questions on that? You wrote on the XC figure up there. Did I miss an intro? Yes. Uh, I mean that the correlators of all operators, right, commutator of vanishes are the like terms. That's the only assumption actually used in the derivation. Uh, of course, implicitly, that usually corresponds to the second order of motion, but that's not what's used in the derivation. You're only using the commutator of vanishes are the like terms. Now, this formula generalizes to the case where uh, the source T menu is not conserved as well, and it gets slightly more complicated, um, and you have, uh, um, so essentially the mass, uh, I'll just look at the massive part. So if T mu is not conserved, then what you should really replace by is, uh, is, a, is a slightly more complicated polarization structure which looks as follows. Where eta hat here is actually an operator, and it's the operator that projects as uh, uh, the divergence of the stress energy as so. So it's a projection operator that projects out the divergence of the stress energy. Uh, so in the case where t minu is conserved, these pieces just act on the t here to give you zero, and then we get the previous uh, result. 
And also in that case, when you, if the stress energy is not conserved, you can have additional contributions because you can have vector contributions which couple to T mu, T mu, nu, a vector contribution, spin one contribution, and an addi additional scalar contribution that couples to this quantity, which is also scalar. Uh, but I won't, won't worry about that because it's kind of central. Okay, so that's the most general. So whatever infrared modification of gravity or even ultraviolet modification of gravity looks like in the weak field limit, it'll always take this form as long as it's variance and variance and local. Uh, and what I'm actually interested in is theories in which, uh, so this is just the ordinary einstein hilbert part, but that can have a, a, a non-trivial wave function normalization. And we can actually take a, we can imagine a limit where this coefficient goes to zero, so we effectively don't have any massless contribution. And that's precisely what we get, for example, in the DGP model, where you have an infinite extra dimension for which the zero mode is not normalizable. And then the graviton effectively is massive because you only have this contribution from the massive states. And that will automatically give you uh, an infrared modified theory of gravity because at large distances, the mass scale kicks in and uh, suppresses the uh, contribution of gravity at large distances. Now, the motivation for these, um, as, uh, as Professor Rosen discussed, is to uh, is, is to is basically is to understand dark energy in the cosmological constant. And so in particular, let me, let me just flash a simple argument of why, for example, if you just think about massive gravity, uh, why that can actually say something uh, maybe helpful about the cosmological constant and potentially solve the cosmological constant problem. And there the idea is, let's suppose we take, uh, we'll get to what the full theory of massive gravity has to be later. Uh, but let me just for imagine for a second you take Einstein Hilbert gravity and you add a mass term uh, which looks roughly like the Pierce Pauli mass term. And we'll flesh out this in more detail precisely later. Uh, and then you add matter. Then in the linearized limit, the effective equation of motion is this Le Lichnerovitz operator, H mu nu, um, is equal to m squared h mu nu minus e to mu nu h uh, plus t mu nu. And uh, if I put their mass point masses in, then we get a t minus 2 over here. Uh, it looks something roughly speaking like that. And what, what if you had the essential idea here is that if you don't have the mass, then we know that what happens is if you have a very large cosmological constant, then this will create a large curvature. Because what's sitting on the left-hand side is basically the, uh, uh, the Ricci, sorry, the Einstein tensor, uh, which measures the curvature of the geometry. And so if you take a stress energy, which is a cosmological constant, which looks in a linearized approximation like something like that, then you can't help have a large curvature. Uh, and of course, this leads to the cosmological constant problem because we expect from vacuum fluctuations to have a very large cosmological constant, but we don't see the universe accelerate uh, as much as we would expect from such a large cosmological constant. However, in, in a theory of massive gravity, this is no longer true. There is another solution because if I now put a cosmological constant in here, I have another solution, which is where instead of having this thing balancing this, I have this term balancing this. And in fact, I can simply find a solution where h mu nu is proportional to lambda over m squared uh, m d minus 2 times e to mu nu, for which the Ricci term is 0. Because if, if the metric perturbation is proportional to the Minkowski metric, then the curvature of that is 0. But this geometry is still Minkowski space. What we're looking at, if, if we reconstruct the full metric, then what we're looking at is a metric which is simply a rescaling of Minkowski space. So what 
this means is in massive gravity, we can accommodate a very large cosmological constant without that leading to acceleration. And it's effectively what happens is the cosmological constant becomes a redundant operator in a theory of massive gravity. We can actually get rid of it by simply redefining it away. Um, and so that, that provides uh, a possible solution to the cosmological uh, constant problem at least in terms of why we don't accelerate as well, why we don't see an extremely large cosmological constant. Of course, on top of that, you still have to explain what dark energy is because we are still accelerating. Uh, but that is part of the motivation. Uh, this is a somewhat unwavy argument, but that's part of the motivation for why it's interesting to look at infrared modified theories of gravity, why they could say something potentially different about the cosmological constant. Yes. Uh, you are now using perturbation, but before, Massive gravity has a exact solution like bridge test case or black hole. So in uh, so in the fully nonlinear theory, which I haven't got to yet, but in the fully nonlinear theory, uh, what happens is that you can perform a rescaling of the metric and rescaling of the feedback field field variables to remove the cosmological constant. So it's a redundant operator in the system. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, but before I get to that, I want to resolve, uh, today I want to talk mainly about uh, resolving this VDVZ discontinuity. And what is the VDVZ discontinuity? So we mentioned it last time. So it's the fact that for a massive graviton, there is a different coupling to this the, straight, the stress energy than there is for a massless one. And in particular, in four dimensions, this factor is minus a half, and this factor is minus a third. Uh, and as we said last time, that is because really what's going on is that minus a third is minus a half plus a six. And a six there corresponds to an extra scalar degree of freedom in the system, which is the Lisby zero mode of the mass of gravity. And that propagates an extra force. Uh, what we would call a fifth force. And if that were the end of the story, this theory would be ruled out phenomenologically. Uh, and we could just forget about it. Uh, but it's not the end of the story uh, because, uh, as I alluded to last time, this is only a weak field calculation. And the way you'll find in r real systems like the solar system is that the list of zero mode will actually uh, not be in the weak field region, it will be strongly coupled, and this calculation is the incorrect calculation, and when you do the full calculation, you find that the actual correction to the force uh, is negligible, and, and I'll get to how to, uh, to do that. But first, let me, uh, let's discuss a little bit more about these, uh, these degrees of freedom again. So, so as I mentioned last time, a massive spin two particle in, two, in, uh, in four dimensions has 2s plus 1, 5 degrees of freedom. And when we take the massless limit, then that splits up into a massless spin 2, really helicity 2 in that case, uh, which has 2 degrees of freedom. A massless spin 1, has two degrees of freedom and a mass that spins zero, which has one degree of freedom. So we see that the five is two plus two plus one. So that's the, cor that's the correct decomposition that gives the correct accounting of degrees of freedom. Now, you, as we know, when you have massless particles, you should have gauge symmetries. So in the massless limit, to have, uh, if you have a massless spin two particle, then there will be four, in, in four dimensions, or D and D dimensions, four linear diffeomorphism gauge symmetries. And general relativity, four diffeomorphisms, well, we're just thinking about the weak field limit, so it's just linear diffs. But there'll be four, four diffeomorphism symmetries that are the gauge symmetries responsible for ensuring that, you are, that a massless particle only has two degrees of freedom. And for a spin one, you have one, you one degree of freedom. Uh, a massless spin-wide particle, as we know, is described by uh, 
uh, Maxwell equations, which has a U1 symmetry. So when we go from the massless to the massive, we break a total of five symmetries, or in D dimension, D plus one symmetries. So D for the diffeomorphisms and one for the U1. And so to better understand the degrees of freedom in this system, it's helpful to actually reintroduce those gauge symmetries uh, and make them manifest by using what's called the Stukeberg trick. After Stukeberg, who first did this for uh, massive, the massive spin one particle. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna do now. And the Stukeberg trick is an extremely helpful way to uh, see what the true degrees of freedom in the system are. Um, and so let's do that. So the way this works is, let, let me, I'm just going to think now about a single mass of spin 2 particle, which is described by the Fierce Pauli uh, action. And so the Fierce Pauli action looks like, I'll do it in D dimensions, uh, I'll put the Planck mass in here as a normalization, and then I'll describe it with a capital H for reasons that become clear. And then they can have a kinetic term, which is essentially just a linearized einstein hilbert term, which is described by the Solutionarovitz operator here. And then there is the fierce Pauli mass term. And this mass term has a very specific structure to ensure that this theory has the correct uh, five numbers as a degree five number as a degree of freedom. So that's the theory. This theory, in this form, has no uh, gate symmetries at all, because it's a massive spin to particle. There's no gate symmetries there. There's no, no that needs to be there. However, what we would like to do is rewrite this in a way that's more helpful to understand from the point of view of taking the massless limit, in which case we want to reintroduce those gate symmetries. Uh, and now, so first off, if you didn't have this term, what would the gate symmetry be? It would just be linear diffeomorphisms, and that gate symmetry would act in the sense of uh, like this, that's a linear diffeomorphism. So what we do is we basically, the Stuckelberg trick tells you to simply perform a field redefinition which corresponds to the gate symmetry itself. So what we're gonna do is perform a field redefinition now to define capital H to be a new field, little h, times what is just the gauge transformation, except now we're going to promote the gauge parameter to be a field. And this is how the Stuckelberg trick works. So you perform, you get the gauge transformation associated with the symmetry you want to reintroduce, and make the gauge parameter itself to be a new field. And this, the virtue of that decomposition is it clearly reintroduces that linear diff symmetry because I can now uh, do the following U1 transformation. If I shift h, little h, by this, and, and simultaneously I shift a mu by the compensating transformation, then capital H will be left invariant. So that's uh, clearly a symmetry uh, of that decomposition. And in fact, what we're going to do is go further. Uh, that's, that, that introduces the four linear diffs, but really there's also the spin one contribution, which will be represented by A. Uh, and that's, that state will also be massive, so I want to introduce uh, that U1 symmetry as well. And so to do that, I'm going to add an extra scalar in, the, in that decomposition, such that there's now an extra U1 symmetry, such that under A mu goes to A mu plus B mu chi, uh, and pi goes to pi minus a half chi, then you can see clearly, so from here, you're going to pick up the 2 mu d mu chi, which is coupled, so it's 2 there, which is cancelled by that. So then now we're going to have a U1 symmetry as well. So of course, 
All this is just theory definitions. It doesn't change the physics whatsoever, but it's extremely helpful to understanding the massless limit uh, of this system. So what we do now is we take that decomposition and we plug it into the action that we had, which is just the fifth family action. And when you plug it in this part, nothing happens because this part was already gauge invariant. And so these contributions will simply drop out. So this part will simply give you capital H replaced by little h. is conserved, which I'll take it to be for simplicity, this coupling to matter over here doesn't get changed because also, the, again, this is a gauge transformation, so I can just integrate by parts, I'll get a divergence of t mu nu, that will drop out. So the only part that gets modified is the mass term, and that gets uh, lots of contributions, uh, and I'll write them out, so I'm going to get one like this, um, and then I get a piece from uh, the, uh, so now this gets complicated, so I'm going to get cross terms between A and H, and expand out, I'm going to get cross terms between uh, pi and H. I'm going to get uh, pi squared terms like this. Um, I'm going to get maybe a lot of lots of terms. Uh, terms with a squares, uh, which are going to go like. I'm going to get, uh, what, am, so what am I missing there? I'm going to get pi a, so got, uh, yeah, I'm missing the pi a terms, so we're going to have pi a terms, which will go like uh, minus a half m squared, diminuing pi times a, um, times a um, so at the moment it's not entirely clear that this is actually healthy, <laughs> but it will do. So I've got pi a terms, a h, pi h, pi squared, a squared, and h squared. I think that's it. I think that's all the terms. Uh, and now, this pi squared term here, which has lots and lots of derivatives, is actually just a total derivative. Uh, so by into you can see this easily by integrating by parts. This term is a total derivative. And so it drops out, at least as long as I can ignore the boundary terms. And now let me uh, clean this up a little bit. And there's several ways to clean this up. I'll just choose the quickest. So because now we've introduced the gauge freedom, uh, so it, we now have a U1 symmetry and we have a linear diff symmetry, then I'm allowed also to now choose a gauge. So let me choose the following gauge. I will choose the Donda gauge, harmonic gauge, uh, and I will choose, so that's for the spin two part that's using the linear diffs, and for the U1, I'll just choose the Renz gauge. Um, this is not actually the best gauge choice, but it's the easiest uh, to explain. Now, if I do that, lots of stuff uh, disappears. Uh, why? Because so this if we so this piece disappears 
here because that's uh, just divergence of A.